In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we're studying the purpose of defense mechanisms and the resultant adulthood problems that are wrought by the defense mechanisms. First of all, the defense mechanisms preserve the sanity of the victim of abuse. But these uh, defense mechanisms develop problems that must be dealt with in adulthood. The defense mechanism that saves the child in childhood will destroy the adult. The defense mechanisms are not designed for adulthood but for childhood. The believer who was abused as a child must deal with the problem of the development of garbage in the scar tissue of the soul. They have not uh, gotten with doctrine. Oftentimes it's very difficult, and therefore they've missed out on a lot of faith perception as children because they were abused. So they must uh, get rid of all the garbage that gets sucked into their soul through matiotes, the vacuum. And the vacuum develops with them at an early age because they've been exposed to child abuse and faith perception has been cut off. Therefore, it builds up in the stream of consciousness and doctrine must push it out. The solution to the problem is in dealing with the problem after remembering the abuse. Sometimes you'll never remember the abuse until it's uh, brought out, in some cases, by psychotherapy. And you won't even remember that it happened, yet you're still functioning under defense mechanisms. Oftentimes, children are so severely abused, they simply forget the time period in which it occurred and completely blot it out and push it into their subconscious, uh, into that part of the mind where you do not recall it consciously. But it's in your subconscious, and it has produced a lot of garbage. So sometimes psychotherapy is helpful in bringing out the past. Now, not always. You can go ahead and not remember the past and go ahead and start learning doctrine. And then if the past does flood back, you'll be able to handle it. And therefore, you must learn and use the problem-solving <coughs> devices. That is the only hope. Now, of course, medicine is a temporary solution to make you stable enough to listen. But uh, even though that medicine might help you function, it's not going to make you completely normal until you get with the Word of God. When the, when the believer reaches the occupation with Christ, sharing the happiness of God and having a personal sense of destiny along with impersonal love for mankind, personal love for God the Father, and all the others related to the ten problem-solving devices, they use the uh, problem-solving devices instead of the defense mechanisms and that will bring recovery. Therefore, the principle for you, if you've been abused, is to forgive as Christ forgave. And when the abuser believes in Christ, everything that they've ever done in the past is blotted out. And Christ has forgiven them, therefore you too must forgive them. So forgive and automatically disregard it. You won't forget it, you'll probably remember it, but disregard it. The believer may or may not be aware of the problem of the garbage in the stream of consciousness, but it is a problem when that garbage begins to be sucked in there by matiotes. But the problem-solving devices can still overcome the sin nature without ever even understanding the fact that you do have garbage in the subconscious. Sometimes it's very blinding and you don't even know it. It just takes years of doctrine before you get out of it, and sometimes you do that without even knowing that you are switching from defense mechanisms to the ten problem-solving devices. It takes time, and you do it, and you might not be aware of it, but it definitely happens anyway, and that's the grace of God. So some summary principles are as follows. All child abuse is related to hatred of the child from total preoccupation with self on the part of the abuser. We're finally getting to the summary principles and uh, we'll get some doctrinal points on it and go on to Matthew 18.11.
and probably have two more Bible classes on this, two or three, and we'll be finished. So all child abuse is related to hatred of the child from total preoccupation with self on the part of the abuser. The guardian angel protects the child and is often the agent for the administration of discipline from the Supreme Court of Heaven. The guardian angel, we remember studying that, that the guardian angel is the one who has protected uh, the children and have acted as an agent for the child. The sovereignty of God wills the recovery of all cases of child abuse. Not only does the sovereignty of God will the recovery of the child, but also the recovery of the child abuser. That's God's grace. Some children, as they move from childhood to puberty to adulthood, are not delivered from abuse because they reject God's system of handling the injustice. In other words, they never believe in Christ. They never use post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, which extrapolates from that the ten problem-solving devices, the development of the spiritual dynamics, rather than the use of uh, mechanism dy dynamics or the defense mechanism dy dynamics. So in adulthood, the defense mechanisms make one maladaptive to life, totally maladaptive. And they will not function correctly in marriage. They will not function correctly in friendship. They will not function correctly in any relationship because they are functioning under the defense mechanisms. And when they use repression... They're always right. The other person in the relationship is always wrong. When they use dissociation, they simply switch from personality to personality to handle a situation, and therefore they're very difficult people to get along with, or very, definitely very difficult people to even come to understand when they're switching about 10 to 20 different personalities on you in one day. And one minute they're sweet and nice, the next minute completely cruel and uh, very difficult for them to get, for you to get along with them as they are maladjusted to life. Oftentimes this is uh, noted by uh, dramatic uh, changes in dress, etc. And uh, one time I had a, a potential girlfriend, and uh, she had I had a lot of pictures of her, and there were maybe about. Uh, ten different pictures, and each one she looked like a different person. And my dad jokingly said, I wonder if she has that many personalities. Maybe so. <laughs> so uh, oftentimes that does occur, and they just uh, change their look even. It's a strange thing that occurs. But it's part of their defense mechanisms being brought into adulthood. How you handle injustice is one of the keys to what kind of person you really are. This goes for the abused person and the non-abused person. How you handle injustice. If you receive injustice in the workplace, if you receive in injustice in any type of relationship, if you don't leave it in the Supreme Court of Heaven and you try to deal with it yourself through revenge motivation and revenge modus operandi, it's going to show what a true person you really are. So if you can handle injustice, you're on your way to becoming a great person. How one handles injustice really uh, determines if they're great or not. And if you're all the time gossiping about injustice or maladapted to injustice and you just think the whole world's against you or you think the whole world's out to get you and you have to gossip malign and rip apart every person in your periphery, then you're not a great person. You're a terrible person. So if you can handle injustice, you are on your way to being a great person. If you can't handle injustice, you are dead in the water and your spiritual life is lacking severely. The victim of child abuse has two volitional opportunities for the solution, and they are simple. Faith alone in Christ alone, and then post-salvation use of the spiritual dynamics, the development of the ten problem-solving devices. So the two answers to this are simple. If you're not saved, faith alone in Christ alone. After you're saved, grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Guardian angels were assigned to a number of children in the sequence of history in eternity past. The guardian angel is required to protect the volition of the child so that, it, it, so that the volition of the child is not destroyed. Without the volition intact, it is impossible for anyone to recover from child abuse or other early injustices in life. 
the guardian angel protects the volition, along with if the parents haven't been the abusers, the parents as well act as guardians of the volition of the child. And so guardian angels were assigned for this purpose because uh, we all need volition in order to make a choice to believe in Christ and then to make a choice to grow in grace and in knowledge. The guardian angel delivers the abused child with the capabilities of recovery intact. The guardian angel delivers the abused child with the capabilities of recovery intact. So no one has an excuse. Oftentimes, if you go to a psychologist, they'll say, you are the way you are because of what happened to you in the past, period, and uh, you can't change it except uh, by using some human viewpoint solution, but they'll just excuse it. And oftentimes, in criminal cases, they excuse it because uh, the criminal had a mean daddy. Well, so what? He still has volition, and some abused people uh, never become criminals. Some do. And environment is never, ever the issue for how you turn out in life. Some people have grown up under extremely terrible circumstances and turn out to be wonderful spiritually. Others grow up under nice circumstances and grow up to be terrible. Some grow up under terrible circumstances and grow up to be terrible as well. But environment's not the answer, never is. Satan thinks it is. He's constantly trying to improve environment, and but it doesn't work because he, uh, even though he's a genius, he is not our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, his fault system is failing, and that's why there are so many problems in the world. So when the child has been abused to the point that their mentality and their volition have been affected in its inability to function normally, they will definitely develop a maximum pain in life. And what occurs then, in God's grace, God takes them to heaven early and stops the pain and suffering, oftentimes taking them to heaven before they reach God consciousness so that they just go straight to heaven. So if the child has been tortured so much that the the only thing they're going to have in life is suffering and pain, a lack of use of normal mentality and normal volition, God will go ahead and take them on home. And that's His grace. And he knows in omniscience in which cases this must occur. And we hear all the time of shaken baby syndrome, where a parent will get angry because the baby is crying and they shake it to death. And the baby dies and goes to heaven. And in that case, uh, God was gracious because they were going to grow up in an environment which, in which their total volition would be destroyed. Therefore, God, in His matchless grace, goes ahead and takes them home. The guardian angel delivers the abused child with the capabilities of recovery intact so that the child can accept or reject the gospel and accept or reject Bible doctrine. Remember, it's no excuse if there's Uh, someone who won't get with doctrine, and you say, well, they've had a terrible life and been abused. So what? And we don't know each, each, each one of us doesn't know each one of us personally enough to know if we've been abused or not, Uh, but so what? Some may have, some may not, but uh, all of you are here. And, And so it's really dependent on volition. And if they're still alive and they're still breathing, whether they've been abused or not, it's their choice. And the fact that they make a choice not to means they would have made the choice whether abused or not. So even though the volition is protected by the guardian angel, there is no guarantee that the volition will be positive to the gospel. In other words, the angel doesn't come down and say, yes, you've had a hard life, but what you must do is believe in Christ and then get with the Word of God. The angel protects the volition, but does not superimpose upon it. Neither does God superimpose upon our volition. God never comes down, knocks on our door, and says, get up out of bed and go to Bible class. And God, He just doesn't do that. He leaves that up to our free will. Therefore, I'll never go knocking on doors. Where have you been? Well, I care, but uh, it's none of my business. And you must live and let live. So the guardian angel delivers the child, but only the child uh, can be positive 
or negative. They make the choice. The only guarantee is freedom to recover from the injustices of life. That's the only guarantee that God provides for everyone. Freedom to recover from the injustices of life. That applies for both the abused and the ones who haven't been abused. We all have freedom to recover from injustices in life. And these injustices, of course, include child abuse, which is what we've been studying. Another factor in survival is the victim failing to win the sole battle of defense mechanisms versus using the problem-solving devices. It is a sole battle for the abused uh, child who then later becomes an adult because they've already developed the defense mechanisms. There's a fight in the soul between them. Uh, one, uh, for example, they instead of uh, rebounding, they remain angry or bitter all day. And so there's a battle. And they may even know rebound and know that they must name their sins to God, but they're reacting to some injustice, as they did in childhood, so they justify themselves. Or they have self-deception into thinking they're right, the other person's wrong, they have a right to function under the sin nature. And then if even if they do rebound, they might... Um, immediately go back into bitterness and be completely self-absorbed. All that's listed on the ten problem-solving devices versus the defense mechanisms. And they constantly battle within the soul of the uh, child, the person who has been abused as a child. It's a constant battle. And uh, whether one wins out or not depends on their attitude toward the Word of God and whether they want to stick with it long enough to push all the garbage out. If they do, they will survive and have stable lives. The volition of the child that has been abused has been locked into maladaptive defense mechanisms. It worked for them as children. It allowed them to adapt as children. But when they become adults, it becomes completely maladaptive. Because when they're adult, when they become an adult, survival is no longer the issue. As a child, it's the issue because they're helpless. So they use the defense mechanisms. As an adult, survival is not the issue anymore and not the solution. So the defense mechanisms should not be there. Survival means uh, later on, if you survive later on, it means that you are free to solve the problem. If you survive through the child abuse, that means that God has allowed you to be free to solve the problem. If you didn't go ahead and die and go to be with the Lord, you're breathing, you're here for a purpose. God doesn't let us remain on this earth if our purpose is over and destroyed. He knows we have enough volition and enough freedom to make the choice to either be, to both believe in Christ and grow in grace. But when you do not want to solve the problem, you become more and more preoccupied with self. The fact is, some people would rather remain in bitterness than to get with the Word of God. Some people would rather remain in hatred. Some people come to love their defense mechanisms. And instead of looking at themselves as maladaptive, they start to look at themselves as great. And they think they have a right to rip apart everyone in their periphery because they are so great. And they begin to wear their abuse as some type of crown. I survived it. I'm great. I have a crown. No, you don't. Lots of people have been through abuse. You're, you survived it because of God's grace and you're still using defense mechanisms when you should be getting with the spiritual life. So a lot of these abused people fall under the syndrome of just loving it. Loving using the defense mechanisms. And I'll tell you the truth, on Jerry Springer, a lot of those people are just a, a bunch of maladapted people who have been abused as children, and they love the bitterness, and they couldn't live one day without some type of strife in their life. They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't know how to live without having strife in their life. If they're not in an argument with someone, if they're not picking fights, then they're just not living. Well, it's the Jerry Springer type uh, mentality, often uh, born out of abuse and the use of the defense mechanisms. And oftentimes there's even a glorification of childhood defense mechanisms that have been carried into the adult life. And they glorify justifying themselves. And the first conversation you ever have with one of these types of people is, uh, someone did me wrong and I'm right. Listen to my problem. And you can't even get a word in edgewise. This person did me wrong, blah, blah, blah. This is how it happened. I'm all right. Don't you agree with me? And if you don't, you become a person who is on their hit list now. 
complete self-absorption, repression, uh, not even thinking that they could ever be wrong, self-righteousness. When you think you're never wrong, you become very self-righteous. And even though, even if you have a function under promiscuity, and even if you have a tendency toward lasciviousness, you, you still become self-righteous. And oftentimes project that sin onto others. Oftentimes, young ladies who have been abused, if they go to a bar and end up fornicating, they don't blame themselves, they blame the guy at the bar, as if they didn't have volition in regards to it either. So there's all sorts of things that come out of this. And the fact is, if you're alive and if you're breathing, whether abused or not, God has given you freedom to to change your mind about Christ and then to change your mind about doctrine. But even if you're unaware of the problem, you can still use doctrine and your volition to control the sin nature because... Uh, When you first start out in the Word of God, you're not going to understand the defense mechanisms. You might first begin to learn rebound and start using it. And then you might suddenly realize you're not filled with the Spirit because you continue to go back to bitterness. And so you rebound 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe even 100 times a day, maybe more. It's been known to happen because they had to. They had lived so long in bitterness, it's just almost a natural reaction for them. Some, Some type of injustice comes their way. And they go bitter. And then if they have sense enough, they'll name it. And if it takes 100, 200, 300 times a day, they'll do it. And finally, because of their motivation, their correct motivation and love for the Word of God, uh, these things will start to be pushed out of their stream of consciousness. And they might go from rebounding 100 times a day. Uh, When they grow up spiritually, it might go down to five times, then two times. And then eventually, if they become uh, go to pleroma to theu, they might only need to rebound once a day or once every other day. And that is uh, because the garbage is being pushed out. The maladaptive defense mechanisms that deliver the child destroys the adult. Therefore, they haven't solved the problem just by using the defense mechanisms. You've only compounded the problem. Defense mechanisms in childhood preserve the sanity of the child. If the child did not have defense mechanisms, they would immediately go insane. And some have been abused enough that they do go psychotic and then must receive medication. And usually when it goes that far, somebody in their periphery notices it and somebody ends up going to jail where they should be. Actually, they should be executed, but... Uh, Our culture usually just sends people to jail. So awareness of the problem may occur in a number of ways in which the victim may have some recall. Then again, they may not have recall. However, we act the way we do, not because of any type of form or child abuse, but because of the sin nature. The child abuse brought out certain defense mechanisms, And then when we're adults, it's all related to the sin nature. So, really, it's all related to the sin nature. And if you stay in reversionism long enough, whether abused or not, you'll still reach out for the defense mechanisms because they're there. You just never tapped into them. Until you stay in reversionism long enough, and if you stay there and reject doctrine your entire life, uh, God guarantees you that you will go daisukos or nuts. And that's because you begin to function under defense mechanisms, whether abused or not. So when the child reacts to injustice, it is inevitable that they will experience rage. That's for the child. When the child experiences injustice, it's inevitable that they will react in rage. And all of the child's reactions will be unknown sins unknown to the child, known to God, unknown to the child. And uh, when a child expresses rage or has a temper tantrum, that's simply a, uh, a glaring demonstration of the old sin nature. And remember, all children function under the old sin nature, and we all did. When we were born, we were born with an old sin nature. When we were two, three years old, we functioned under the sin nature. Uh, maybe we were saved at five and functioned outside the sin nature for about five seconds and then went right back into the old sin nature because uh, it's very unusual. Any five-year-old would understand rebound. I don't know if any ever has, 
Maybe. But uh, if they don't, well, they'll be under the sin nature all the way up probably until their teenage years when they really start to learn how to rebound, etc. And then before that time, it's sin nature all the way, all the time. It was for me, it is for all of us. And it's just the way we're born with the old sin nature. So when they react, it's unknown. It's a, this reaction of anger is an unknown sin to the child. It's, simple, it's a simple, normal reaction. But when they grow up and they become believers, they must be careful to avoid sinful involvement with the past. Disregard the past. Forgetting those things that are behind and pressing onward toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is what you should be doing. Forget, forget the past. Disregard the past. Uh, stop. Avoid the sinful involvement that occurred in the past. All of us have had sinful involvement. Uh, most of us, uh, actually, all of us still to still do today. But we are commanded to avoid it. And the best way is to rebound and be filled with God, the Holy Spirit. Never use your past as an excuse for your present sins. Never use your past as an excuse for your present sins. Somebody gets very angry with their wife, maybe for the first time slaps her across the face and says, I'm sorry I was raised that way. It's not an excuse. But through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, maybe they can grow out of it. But if they're not growing in grace and in knowledge, they'll never grow out of it. Therefore, leave them. But uh, in some cases, there is reform. There have been re reformed cases from learning the Word of God. And if they're learning the Word of God, then they'll, they'll probably be reformed and be a much better husband than anyone else out there. And so, uh, in some cases, you have to jump out. If you're getting beat half to death all the time, jump out of it. And I could understand, if even if you were just slapped just once, wanting to run out on a, a someone like that. But uh, there are some certain circumstances where it might be best to stay. But if it's constantly occurring, get the hell out. So the believer must be careful to avoid sinful involvement with the past. Never use your past as an excuse for your present sins. Although the past did have an influence on it. I'll give them that, but it's not an excuse. And they say, I was influenced in my past because I grew up under violence, etc. Probably all of that's true. And probably they were influenced a great deal, but it's never an excuse. The believer who reacts to the past will become a loser in the present and will fail to glorify God in the future. And uh, if a believer who has in the past reacted to it then decides to get with the Word of God, well, they will glorify God in the future and all of those past sins are forgotten. So what we have next, we'll take a look at some uh, New Testament passages regarding the fact that we should avoid these the sins that almost naturally arise due to child abuse. Hebrews chapter 12, 15. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. In Hebrews 12, 15, it says this, Take care, therefore, that no one come short of the grace of God. Take care, therefore, that no one come short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. Take care, therefore, that no one come short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. Right here we have a case in which bitterness is not justified. Not even the bitterness of the child who has been abused. Therefore, their present reaction to the past is unfounded. Your bitter reaction is a root, actually. And it's a root that oftentimes got, oftentimes got started in your childhood. Your bitter reaction to the past covers everyone in the present with excrement. In other words, if you hang around bitter people, if you hang around people who are bitter all the time, no matter what a spiritual giant you are, you too will be covered in excrement. You know what excrement is. I won't uh, describe it to you. 
my pastor described this uh, spreading of ex excrement very well. In the Middle Ages, they would walk down the street, and that's where chivalry came out, because the man would have to walk on the outside of the sidewalk, uh, or the inside of the sidewalk, while the woman would stand away from the sidewalk, you know, with their arms like that. Because back then, they didn't have a system, a sewage system, where the excrement would go into the ground. They would just simply throw it out of the window and onto the people below who were walking and doing their daily business. And so even though the man standing there beside the woman did nothing to cause any bitterness, he gets flattered with it. And if you go to a party and there's a person there who is bitter... Well, they become like a sore th thumb. You know, the, the whole party seems to be dampened or ruined. If everybody's having a good time laughing, partying, and playing games, etc., and there's one person who's over there bitter because of uh, some fight he had with his wife or his girlfriend, well, he's going to really put a damper on the party, and bitterness will be spread. So to hang around bitter people is... Uh, well, I, I don't know why anyone would like to unless they have that tendency themselves. But if you do, you'll be splattered with the excrement. Because all they're going to do in your relationship with them is dig up the past, and they're also going to try to stir trouble in your periphery. They're bitter. They want everyone to be bitter. The only thing they're going to want to do in social life is gossip. Talk about something. Talk about somebody else. And... Uh, the reason why this church is small is we don't put up with it. So, James 3.14, If you have bitter jealousy and strife in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. This is James 3.14. Also a warning against bitterness. James 3.14. If you have bitter jealousy and strife in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. People who constantly like to gossip, malign, and judge and have bitterness, and they usually possess a lot of jealousy as well, and they possess a lot of strife in their heart, which means their heart is corrupt. The heart is evil and desperately wicked above all things, by the way, especially for the person who's not growing in grace and in knowledge. And some of the people with the most dastardly hearts are believers in Christ who do nothing but gossip, malign, and judge all day long and go to churches where they don't teach doctrine. And they're saved and they're going to heaven, but they're wretched people with evil hearts. If you have bitter jealousy and strife in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. In digging up the past, the victim of child abuse may react with bitterness and often does. All too often, victims of injustice remember the past for the purpose of self-justification and blaming others under the principle of self-absorption and projection. They want to project everything onto others. They want to, uh, they want to come out smelling like roses while everyone around them is the one who is excrement. And what this means is a lot of these people under the defense mechanisms are covered with dung and don't even know it. Kind of like uh, my cousin uh, got his motorcycle and was, I told you this story before, some of you may have not been here, but he was young, he was, in his te he was a teenager at this time and he, his dad bought him his, his uh, second or third dirt bike. And they went out in this flat area in Spartanburg uh, where it was real muddy because it had just rained and just uh, started slinging mud everywhere. They thought it was mud. And there would be rooster tails coming off the back of the uh, bike a hundred feet high. And they were having a blast. But they were covered in something and didn't know it because uh, my uncle looked up and saw the sign that said Spartanburg County Sewer System. They were covered in dung and didn't know it. But when they found out, well, they didn't keep wallowing in it. They ran home, and it was uh, winter time and cold, but they didn't care. And with the outside hose, just whoosh, washed it off. But people in bitterness, and oftentimes, oftentimes the child abuser in bitterness, will be covered in dung, and they will still wallow in it. They love it, and they don't even know it. They're jumping around in the Anderson sewer system with a big smile on their face. Yippee. 
It's, uh, it's weird, but this is what the defense mechanisms do. And if you get near those people while they're splashing around, it's going to get on you. And, and by the way, some, if you hang around with the wrong people, divine discipline can be shared. Remember, Jonathan was a great man, David's best friend, but because of his association with his father, he died very young. And uh, David loved Jonathan because they had great rapport in doctrine. But in the end, uh, Jonathan was uh, his pull. His father had so much pull with him that uh, he wouldn't break away from his father, and uh, Saul's whole family was eventually wiped out. Now, if he would have passed that test, if Jonathan would have passed the test and said, uh, "You know what, Dad? I love you. You're my dad, but uh, you, you've lost it. You are a crazy." Blank, blank maniac, and I am, uh, and David's my friend, and you're trying to kill him, and it's because you're a reversionist, and I don't approve of this. I'm stick, I'm sticking with David. Or if he, he didn't even have to say anything. He could have just stuck with David. And if he would have done that, that he would have lived longer. Be careful with whom you hang around. Survivals of child abuse should only recall the past to understand and overcome. Survivors of child abuse should only recall the past to understand and overcome the past. This is a concept found in Romans 12, 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Stop being conquered by evil. This is Romans 12, 21. If I'm going too fast, well, uh, let me slow down for you. Romans 12:21. What? Stop being conquered by evil, but conquer evil by means of the absolute good. This is good of intrinsic value, the same type of good found in Ephesians. Romans 12:21. Stop being conquered by evil but conquer evil by means of the absolute good. What is the absolute good? The divine solution. Absolute good, ten problem-solving devices. Absolute good, the two power options. Absolute good, Bible doctrine. And you conquer evil by means of learning this absolute good. This is why Paul said in Philippians 3.13, verse 14, a very important verse for every child abuser to understand, or person who has been child abused to understand. That's Philippians 3.13 and 14. And not only important for the abused person to understand, but a verse that we should all memorize because it deals with a very important principle in life. And it deals with something that is a huge problem today in Christianity, and that is guilt. A lot of churches glorify guilt. And if you don't feel guilty about the sins that you've committed, well, you're you're probably not even saved. If you don't walk down to the altar and weep and cry and forsake your past and feel guilty about your past, they'll say you had a head belief and not a heart belief, whatever that means. It's nonsense. And they promote guilt in most churches. Just as synagogues promote guilt. Just as the Muslim religion promotes guilt. When you promote guilt, you are actually acting as an unbeliever deep in religion. Because remember, Christ took all the guilt. We have no right to it. So this is the mandate to forget it and definitely a mandate not to be associated with guilt. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. One thing I do, on the one hand, disregarding those things which are behind, and on the other hand, driving hard toward what is ahead. This is the corrected translation from the Greek in which this is needed. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's a type of, uh, it's what we use, and this is how it would come out. One thing I do, on the other hand, disregarding those things which. On the one hand, disregarding those things which are behind, and on the other hand, driving hard toward what is ahead. And driving hard toward what is ahead simply means Bible doctrine number one, today, the next day, uh, and following, day after day. Bible doctrine, Bible doctrine, Bible doctrine. That's how you drive hard toward it. 
And um, I know tradition says once a Sunday or twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday, but uh, that's just tradition that has mainly been produced by the Catholic Church a long time ago. Remember, the Catholic Church means universal, and at one point there were nothing but Catholics. No such thing as Protestants. And everybody had a universal church. And most people couldn't even read the Bible. So what the priest said is what went. And oftentimes what the priest said was crazy. And so a tradition came out of this. Church on Sunday. The rest of the time, work hard and give all your money to the church. But uh, church will be on Sunday and then we will observe some ritual. And that's about it. And that has come down into present day. So because of tradition... Uh, people see a church that meets every day and they're shocked. Well, they don't. Uh, we don't follow tradition. There's no need. To, uh, when you press hard, you don't press hard by going one, oh well, 20 minutes on a Sunday and then sing to your heart's content and then uh, tithe and give a whole bunch of money to a pastor who, well, he might work hard in going to hospitals and such if he has a big church, but. If not, he's uh, usually just a bum. I can say that because if I only taught for 20 minutes on a Sunday, I would be bored out of my mind. Well, I would definitely have a, a, probably a, another job as well, and maybe some do, but I doubt it. Some probably do. But this is what Paul said, The one thing I do, on the one hand, disregarding those things which are behind, and on the other hand, driving hard toward what is ahead. I keep advancing toward the objective for the reward of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This reward deals with escrow blessings. So it's important for us to press hard so that we can receive escrow blessings, both for time and in eternity. And uh, once a Sunday is not going to earn you a crown. Not that you earn it anyway. It's all by grace. But most people think they're earning what they get. And so a lot of people like to brag, I go to church every Sunday and tithe, and God bless you too, etc. Well, so what? And, and they think, they, and then they'll say, I'm going to get a crown. They'll sing songs, the contemporary songs. Uh, no one's going to take away my crown. Well, you're not even pressing forward toward the crown. You're so far from your crown, they're going to be shocked when they get into heaven. Some of them might be shocked that they get in, and then others will be shocked when they don't get their crown. So, it's escrow blessings, and it's important. But it's not a means of motivation. I know this. I mean, I could tell you about all the crowns and, and all the rewards that we receive, and one day we'll go over every one of them. And I could tell you about all the escrow blessings we receive as well and how they are far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. But I know that doesn't motivate. What motivates is your love for God, not your anticipation of crowns and blessings. It's your love for God that motivates always. Because I could get up and motivate every day by saying, you better get with doctrine, you'll lose your crown. And if you don't want it, you're not going to take it because it comes down to your love for God. And if you do it on the basis that you're going to get a crown, well then something's off there. It always should be because of your love for God. So Matthew 18.11. Matthew 18.11. Hmm? Yeah, it's not there, right? I don't know. How many of you have Matthew 18.11? You do? It's got a asterisk. How about you, Darlene? It's just not even there? So it goes Matthew 18.10 to 18.12? And that's the NIV? I've always liked the NIV. So Matthew 18.11 is not there. It was an addition. The older manuscripts did not have it. And the older manuscripts were more accurate because the people didn't get to get a hold of it and tinker with it. Somebody got a hold of this and tinkered with it. And what they did is added their own little commentary. They were trying to explain what was, being, what was happening here. But, uh, and while the verse, that if you have it there, it's for the Son, I don't know why I go over it, it's not part of Scripture, but I'll just tell you, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's a doctrinally correct. 
Nothing wrong with that verse whatsoever, but actually everything's wrong with it because it's not part of the Scripture. So uh, what happened was a well-meaning fellow was reading this and said, nobody's going to understand what this is saying unless I add a little commentary in here and add 18.11 to the, ver- to the Bible. You see the arrogance that's involved in that. You can't add to the Bible. So, <clears throat> but actually, you got the explanation all wrong as well. So, point one, Matthew 18.11. This verse is an accurate statement and is found in Luke 19.10. It's an accurate statement. It's found in another part of the Bible, Luke 19.10. But it doesn't belong in Matthew. Luke 15.3-4 is the parable of the lost lost sheep. And and in this context, Matthew 18.12-13, we have straying sheep, not lost sheep. So this fellow looked at Luke and said, Aha, our Lord's talking about lost sheep here. So he added it in because he thought it would help people who were studying. But he's wrong because it's not talking about lost sheep. It's talking about straying sheep. In Luke, Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees. It's a whole different situation in Luke. In Matthew, Jesus is talking to the disciples. So he took a totally... Uh, a completely different situation and just put it right in Matthew. Some people, uh, but uh, it shouldn't shock anyone. People add to Scripture all the time today. Uh, if a lot of Baptists could get a hold of the Bible, it would be Matthew 18.11. For the Son of Man has come asking you to invite Him into his, into your heart. Or, and then Matthew, well, and then they'd get going. Matthew 18.12. Weep tears of repentance at an altar. They add all the time from the pulpit, of course. And, uh, well, they act as if it's from Scripture, don't they? But the Scripture is the Word of God, and anyone who adds to it or takes away from it is in for some severe punishment. This verse does not occur here according to the best manuscripts. And the older manuscripts uh, have been discovered, and it's not there. And the NIV has been... A lot of the scholars who have translated the NIV got smart enough to say, you know what, why even bother with it? It's not even part of Scripture. So they just skip it, which is good, because it's not there. Some copyists thought that it was necessary to take a parable out of Matthew 18:12 through 13 They thought it was necessary to make this into a parable, but it's not a parable because, remember, a parable doesn't deal with specific uh, people and it doesn't deal with uh, specific places. And right now he's dealing with a specific child. Remember, he's using the child as an illustration. But what happened was this copyist adapted Luke 19.10 erroneously into Matthew 18.11. But we have thousands of older manuscripts that show that this verse is not in Matthew. The other problem with throwing this in there is the context of Matthew 18:12 through 13. Matthew 18:12 through 13 is not salvation, not in this case, but the reaction of the believer who is a victim of child abuse. This is the reaction in Matthew 18:12 through 13. It's dealing with the reaction to the believer one who's already saved to child abuse, and it's not a lost sheep, it's a straying sheep. Big difference. The recovery from child abuse is the subject of Matthew 18:12 through 14. The reaction to child abuse is the analogy to the straying sheep. This is not a parable, it's an analogy. So somebody who didn't even know what Matthew was talking about just inserted a verse. Nut. Matthew 18:12. For your own benefit, what do you think? And I sure am glad that there are some better translations out because if I were teaching this in the 1960s when they basically had the old King James Version and I were to come up and say, oh, Matthew 18.11, scratch it out, who would I ever get some type of... Uh, I would be a heretic and people would start pulling out swords and Zach would charge me with this thing that he's got there. What do you mean that's not part of the Bible? It's right here. I can see it. Well, thank God some things have changed. So Matthew 18:12, for your own benefit, what do you think? 
If any man owns a hundred sheep, and one out from among these ha- them have gone astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one who has gone astray? Of course he will. So believers go astray. If you can go astray, it means you've been found. If you're lost, you're lost. If you're lost, you're unsaved. That's why Judas Iscariot is lost and not straying the difference between the the words here and the Greek words. So straying sheep would be us. All us believers are like sheep and have gone astray. But uh, those who are unbelievers are simply lost. Can't go astray if you haven't been found. So if you're going to solve the problem of injustices in your life, you must do so from your thinking. Thinking is very important. And I understand some of this is hard to chew on although some of you might be picking it up very well. I'm not sure, but I know some of you are interested in it, and some of you might have a hard time chewing on it, but uh, it takes thinking. We have to have the thinking of Christ, and we have to have thinking to put the spiritual life all together. And, of course, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, makes all of that much easier. You do not fulfill God's plan for your life in solving your problems until you've established the defense line in your soul, which are composed of the ten problem-solving devices. With the ten problem-solving devices, there's no problem in life too great to overcome or too great to keep on the outside as adversity instead of converting it into stress in the soul. A lot of times child abuse brings with it tremendous amounts of stress. And the tendency for the person who has been abused is to follow that type of trend. They want to follow uh, stress. They want to uh, worry about things. It's almost a natural reaction. Something bad happens in life, well, let's worry about it. Not that it helps anything, but that's the way you've been conditioned. And sometimes for the uh, the person who has been child abused, they need some type of uh, medicine so that they can calm down just a bit and also be able to listen to the Word. And never look down on anyone because they need some medicine. You don't know what they've been through in life. And sometimes for the abused child to take an anti-anxiety medication is just as us taking an aspirin when we've got a headache. And none of us uh, looks down our noses at someone when they say, man, i got a headache, let me pop three of leaves. And nobody says, ooh but somebody has some type of stress disorder because of the background, and it almost has become physiological because of the time period in which they've been operating this way, and then they say, well, I need to calm down, let me take my anti-anxiety medication, and then people go, ooh, well, so what? They're trying to help themselves out so that they can relax and listen to the Word and apply doctrine. In the same way, if you had a migraine headache... uh, I've had a couple recently in which I can't even come to class. Well, you can't function with a migraine headache. And you can't come to class and learn anything with a migraine headache. And if you ever have one, don't come. Because usually you hear my voice uh, uh, booming every now and then. You'll have to run to the bathroom and vomit, especially with them lights. If you get a migraine and have those fluorescent lights, you're doomed. You, you, you just uh, It intensifies the pain. So what do you do? You take medicine. And if you take it before church and it starts to feel better, maybe you'll make it. But if you don't feel good, you're not going to make it. Same with with anxiety. If if you're all tore up and uh, feel terrible about uh, everything that's going on and it's because of your reaction, and I'm not saying it's not uh, sinful. Anxiety is sinful, but sometimes uh, it's a result of... It's not an excuse, but it is a result of what has happened in childhood. It's a cause for it. And... uh, There's a cause for sexual sin, lust. And there's a cause for it, but it's not an excuse. But if you can help yourself out, why not? That's common sense to me, but uh, people like to get judgmental, and I don't understand that. Divine solutions come through divine viewpoint. Divine viewpoint comes through what you believe. What is important in life is what you think. Not how you feel, really, or not that how you believe. You know, when uh, especially, I'm not down on young ladies, but especially young ladies when they do writing projects and the teacher says, uh, 
write about, and this may happen, write about abortion and tell me what you think about it, whether it should be legal or not, etc. And I had to do something like that in high school. And so a lot of people begin to write and say, well, I feel it's wrong. No, you think. If you feel it's wrong, feel, uh, F-E-E-L, if you feel it's wrong, well, that's meaningless. I mean, it's just, why not just say, I feel bad? It's what you think that counts, whether right or wrong, it's what you think that counts. And what saves a nation is not morality per se, but knowledge of the Word. That's all found in Hosea. And it's what you think that matters. Uh, what do you think, that, what would the Lord be, uh, well, let's put it this way. Let's say you have a, a tendency toward lasciviousness and uh, you've uh, had about uh, ten different sex partners within the past two weeks. And let's say at the same time, though, you've been learning doctrine and you've grown in grace and uh, you rebound every time you do it and you know you shouldn't, but you do it anyway and you rebound and you'll be punished for it even though you've rebounded. It's not a license to sin. And, but you grow in grace and in knowledge and you're getting the Word of God. And then on the other hand, you have someone who's been going to a church that doesn't teach the Word every Sunday and they would never think of fornicating. And let's say, just uh, for the sake of making it equal, let's say they're beautiful people and they would never think of fornicating even though the temptation is around them. But they never hear doctrine. Who's better off? The person who hears doctrine. It's shocking for people who have grown up under legalism to hear it this way. But remember, King David had ten wives and was a man after God's own heart. That's why I use ten. Because he had ten wives. Now, it doesn't excuse it. It was wrong. But he learned doctrine and that is what made him a man after God's own heart. It was doctrine. And we all misbehave sometimes. And uh, a lot of misbehavior is on the other side in terms of legalism, in terms of gossip, maligning, and judging. It's all sin. It's all punished. But what God is impressed with is His Word. And when you have His Word in your soul, that's what He's impressed with. And you could be the most moral person on the face of the earth and still go to hell. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things so that we can come to understand that we should not focus on the injustices in our life, but focus on the divine solution. Focus on the fact that there is no problem in life that has not already been solved in eternity past by You giving to us the availability of the ten problem-solving devices. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.